House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is pleasuring us. I am. I <laughs> am. With his presence. Yes. Just, just your presence alone. Just my presence? Pleasures, people. Yes. Such a dirty word now. No. You know? No blue pills. No blue pills. Involved. Oh, I see you knew the color. I don't even know <laughs> right. what the color of the pills are. Because <laughs> I'm in my 60s and I don't need to take them. No, I see. <laughs> see. I don't even know what they would be. Not even recreationally? No. 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 <laughs> No, my prescription plan won't cover them anyway. <laughs> see, yeah, I like mine will either. No, you see, and they're no. expensive, expensive yeah. little pills. You can get knockoffs on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of knockoffs, so we've got the horror writer, um, we'll call him that, uh, Mark Allen Gunnels, joining us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I don't think I would do um, knockoff pills. Isn't that dangerous? Aren't you scared? Of what you'll get in the mail? Well, I'm not saying I do it, but I'm just saying if you don't have much money, you have to be economical. Economical is no good if you're dead. Wow. Well, I mean, I don't know. I see, th I see that all the time. There's all sorts of advertisements for buying things on the Internet, like pills and medications. But how do you know you're getting the right thing? It's probably like that scene in The Birdcage where he was giving him a pill that was really just aspirin with the A and the S scraped off. <laughs> <laughs> he just used only fans to fund it. Fund it. Yeah. Well, there you go. You see, yeah. that's it. Well, I'll get on that. I'll I have that. all the answers. Of course you do. I'll get that all together this afternoon, <laughs> you know, and uh, see what happens. So so what's going on with Mark Gunnels? It's been a while. Um, so what's been going on the last couple of years? You've been continuing to write books and 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 live life. And what's how's, how's life been? Uh, life's actually been pretty good. Um, you know, once we got through the... The craziness we all went through for a while. Life started to get back to normal. Um, I'm always writing. Uh, have a day job that I enjoy, which is, you know, I'm almost 50, and it's the first time in my life I can say that. Have a beautiful house with my husband. He completely redid my office for me, and I'm really enjoying that. Wow, nice. So things have been pretty good. So how can we wreck that? <laughs> well... I mean, I guess you can send me a lot of those knockoff pills and see if they kill me. <laughs> well, yeah, but you don't need them, you know. But you know, this would be a good story, wouldn't it? How do you? This 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 reminds me of how how do you come up with it? Is this how it happens for a horror writer? Do you, you are you just sort of sitting there thinking about you know pills, blue pills, I guess, and all of a sudden decide, well, this would be an interesting story. Like, where does it start for you? I mean, it sort of does happen that way. I mean, I can just be having a conversation, overhearing a conversation and something. And sometimes I'll hear something and I'll think there's a story in that, but I won't know what it is. But I still tuck it away. And I think my subconscious mind works on it. And sometimes it takes a while. Um, the, the novel I have out now, Septic, is based on an event that happened not to me, but to someone I went to high school with. And like I said, I'm almost 50. So that was a while back. Um, but it just took me until recently to realize like, Hey, I think, I think I can turn that into a story. Well, and, and so it's, it's really based on something that, that happened in a sense. Do, do you involve people that were involved in as well? Do you take the characters and just change them or what, what goes on there? I didn't. I usually, um, take the premise, the idea, but create my own characters with their own personalities, you know, that will keep me from getting sued. And, you know, <laughs> let's face it, the people in my head are usually more interesting than the people I meet anyway. So it's just fun to take the idea and go with it. Sometimes I will take people I really know, and with their permission, I'll pop them in the book as a cameo. But I, I usually ask them first because a lot of my stuff I set locally in the area where I live. So, you know, I, I knew some ladies who did the local news. So I asked them, like, mind if I pop you into a book? Um, they're going to be watching the news, have you on there. 
So I do have fun doing that sometimes. Well, you know, the story looks like it, it takes place in 1988. I was 17 at that time, matter of fact. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering, do you have to, I guess, uh, you know, go back and do some research uh, back into 1988? Or can you do this all from memory? The memory is failing. <laughs> yeah, so I too. definitely had to keep track of things and make sure, you know, what was out at that time? Is this reference too early, too late? Um, and the thing I had to guard against is technology is just so pervasive in our lives now. When I had finished the whole thing and was doing my second pass through it, I found a place where I mentioned uh, GPS and Google, just because it's so n natural to us now that I'm like, okay, just completely missed that the first time. Like, nope, <laughs> it would not be <laughs> happening in 1988. So I have to ch have to take that stuff out. But it's also fun to go back and sort of relive those times at a distance. I didn't I can't say I much enjoyed 1988 when it was happening. <laughs> but in retrospect, as a grown man, I can go back and have fun with um, stories set in that time period. Well, it's in, it's interesting, but like Ed, I always wonder what it would be like. What what is it about a story that makes you want to? you know, write it into a, into a book or into a story or something, because, um, you know, lots of things I'm sure happened to you over the uh, almost 50 years you've been alive. So what, what is it about certain things that intrigue you enough that you want to follow through with it? Well, I get a lot of, um, premises in my head and what really makes one come alive to me and want to write it is I'll get the premise first and then I'll start thinking about the kind of characters I could have in a story that revolved around that premise. And it's the characters that usually get me excited to write it. Um, when I start to think of specific personalities, that's when I get into it. It's almost always the characters that want to draw me into a story. Um, because like I said, I'll get, I, I'll think, oh, that would make a good idea, but I can't make it work until I know who's going to be in that story. Did you have a point to it? Like, there's something you want to tell people when you're telling a story? Like, do you want them to get something out of that story besides just the, the horror? I mean, I guess, first and foremost, I always want people to be entertained. Um, because writing, for me, is a joyous experience. I want the reading of it to be fun. I don't usually go in with a set, like, message or point, but sometimes they, they just develop organically. Um I mean, Septic is a pure suspense novella, but as I was writing it, I had a lot to say about, um, I'm very big on the subject of queer representation. And in the 80s, when I was growing up, there wasn't much to be found in popular media. And yet we were still there. We still existed. So when I'm writing something like that, I want to show there were queer people that existed in the 80s and how life was for them and the things they had to deal with. So I don't, I try not to do it in a preachy, I'm teaching you a lesson way. But like I said, it's the characters. So that's the lives they live. That stuff is going to come up. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the, um, the differences. Do you think it was, do you think it was a better time back then than it is now? No, <laughs> certainly not for me, but for queer people in general, definitely not. Um, I mean, I was coming of age during the height of, the AIDS crisis, and I mean, we were just vilified, and it was God's punishment, and we were mentally ill, and and I mean, some of that still exists. But I've in my life, I've seen more progress than I ever would have imagined when I was a teenager. Like when I was a teenager, I never thought there would be a point where I could get legally married to another man. So I celebrate all the progress we've made while recognizing there's still work to be done and there are still people out there who want to roll back that progress. So you have to stay alert and stay. And that's why I think queer representation matters so much. And I think that's why the conservatives always start in with the censorship and they want to get rid of the queer positive books and because they understand that the representation in the media, I think, actually helped pave the way for a lot of the progress because people started becoming familiar with us through television and movies and books. As odd as that sounds, it helped make us more human to them through the, through the fiction. 
So there's kind of a powerful thing that I think happens with that sort of thing. But um, one thing I would say is that um, th- that's true, but what happens is uh, this, it becomes very sexualized. That seems to be the one thing that they can um, point out or bring to attention of the public to make it sound bad. You know what I mean? Well, that's the a thing, especially with a lot of the YA books, is they say they don't want us teaching kids about sex, but having a book with two dads isn't teaching them about sex any more than a book with a mom and a dad. So even when there's nothing sexual in a work, that's the where they want to go to to make it seem bad. But um, I will say in adult work, I like to see the characters not sexualized, but I like to see characters that have that component because I feel like a lot of what we started getting early with representation was the neutered gay character who was there for humor and one-liners and to be the female lead's best friend, but didn't have a fully realized life like that because, you know, sex is a part of everybody's life. Even if you're not having it, you have a sexual component to your life usually. So I like to see the queer characters treated that way too in adult work. Um, and I, I think the more we normalize that, the less they can latch onto that as something bad because it's just sort of blending in with the way all characters are treated. Right, right, and it takes time. Now, what do you, what do you think about a lot of the um, trope characters? But there's because it's more prevalent in a lot of books and uh, and stories and shows and stuff like that. But there's a lot of kind of it's kind of the same old character a lot of times over and over. I feel like the more we push and then the more we get queer content creators, the the better we're getting. Um, but I, I do know what you mean. And I even I had mentioned I had read a book by um, the author Christopher Rice, who is um, Anne Rice's son. And it really struck me because it, it was a, a romance book. And one of the leads was a very effeminate gay man. And it made me realize how rarely you see an effeminate gay man as the hero and the romantic lead. Because I feel like to make people more comfortable, you usually get the, for lack of a better term, straight acting gay character. And then if there is an effeminate character, that's the comic relief. So it actually, as someone who is a little more on the effeminate side, it kind of excited me to see, because I mean, I feel like a lot of people in the, queer community know that among gay men, there can even be a prejudice against effeminate men. Um, so I like seeing that. So I am all about diverse queer characters because there are so many different kinds of us all over the world. Can anybody write um, a gay character? I mean, I do believe, I mean, I believe as writers, we should be writing a lot of different kinds of characters. So I don't have an issue with straight writers who write gay characters, but I want them to know what they're talking about. I want them to do like, hopefully you know some gay people because sometimes I feel like I can tell when I don't think they know any gay people. Like, (laughs) I don't know about this, but so, you know, do your research, talk to your gay friends because you want to get it right. And because you know it's kind of true. We have very we are similarities with straight people, but there are things about our our upbringing, especially depending on how old the gay character is, where the gay character comes from, that's going to affect them. I always say a character being gay might not be super relevant to the plot, but it should always be super relevant to the character and their personality. Um, it's going to have an effect on them. You can't just rewrite a book and take a straight character and say they're gay, it's going to have more of an effect than that is my opinion on the matter. Yeah. You got to go out there and have sex with a man in order to write a, I mean, it it (laughs) couldn't hurt. Well, how do you, how do you experience your characters then you yourself? So when you're sitting at home or wherever it is you're writing, um, are you having conversations with them? Do you hear them? Do you see them? Do you feel them? How do you have any sort of relationship with your characters or are they totally distant? When I'm in a book, especially a novel um, or even a novella as opposed to a short story, and I'm living with them for a little while, there's this weird kind of thing that happens where I wouldn't say I have conversations with them, but they sort of exist along beside me. 
And when I come to write, I feel like I'm spending time with them. And the more I write, the more I try to, and you know, I can't, I don't know if I can even explain it, but I try to develop distinct enough and strong enough personalities that when I get, put them in certain situations, I know how they're going to react. So if I was planning to have something happen, but then it would no longer make sense for that character with that personality to react a certain way, I'll alter the plot of the book over the character's personality. Because once that's developed, they sort of tell me like what they would do in any given situation. And that makes it kind of fun because then I can kind of veer off into unexpected areas, which hopefully translates to the reader as not being able to really predict where the story is going to go. Well, you know, I, I was surprised to learn that like 20%, maybe even up to 50% of people uh, have no internal dialogue. Um, and it, I was wondering if, if, if you, when you're writing, uh, whether it's prose or the dialogue itself, do you have an internal monologue? Can you hear your characters? Or do you um, create prose and uh, dialogue in some other fashion? Uh, I feel like I kind of, my whole life, have always kind of lived in my imagination. Like, even if I'm not writing, in my head there's always some kind of weird story or narrative going on, to the point that it's it's almost weird for me to think that there are people in the world who just go through life without constantly making up stories in their head. I'm like, even if it's not like an actual narrative I'm going to write, like in any situation, I may think like, what would have happened if this had gone this way instead of that way? And I don't know. I'm just constantly living in an, and you know, it might come from the fact that when I grew up, I was, I didn't have a lot of friends. I spent a lot of time by myself. So there was a lot of imaginative play going on and I just never lost that. It's just constantly going on in my head. It's it's very busy up there, so only a little bit of it leaks out onto the page. <laughs> oh, so were you when you were a kid? Were you going around telling stories about other kids getting them in trouble? <laughs> we won't tell anyone. I pretty much avoided other kids. Um, other kids in the '80s and the South were horrible, so I stuck to myself. Um, but I sometimes made up stories. This will sound maybe odd, but maybe not. But because even as a, at a young age, I was a huge horror movie fan. So I would invent horror movies in my head, sometimes original horror movies. Sometimes I would invent my own sequel to, say, Nightmare on Elm Street. And then sometimes I would just steal the people around me and they would be characters in the movie that was going on in my head. So, you know, maybe it's psychosis. I just assume to think of it as imaginative right well you weren't actually killing them so were you were you killing off people in these these stories in your head that were bad to you or you didn't like well sometimes i mean there were horror movies going on in my head <laughs> so but you know yeah. but you know sometimes it was all it wasn't always horror movies sometimes i invented storylines for the facts of life that's just how crazy I was as a kid. I would, in my head, I would write myself into, like, shows I liked. A, a lot of, of that going on. The more I say it out loud, the more I feel like they should have gotten me therapy as a child. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it turned me into a writer, so I'm not going to complain. You were hanging out with Tootie and Blair. Yeah, especially Natalie, because Natalie was the one who wanted <laughs> yeah. to be a writer. So I was, you know, that's the one I was drawn to. Would you have a favorite character you've written? There are some characters I... I wrote a novel that came out um, last year called The Advantaged, which actually isn't a horror novel. It's more of a coming-of-age story. But uh, the main character in that, Silas, I have a lot of affection for. Um, and part of it is because he was so not perfect. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to really relate to a character that seems too perfect because then they don't seem real to me. I felt like he had the kind of flaws I could at least understand. He was definitely one of my favorite characters that I've written. And um, in the one that I have out now, Septic, I have two characters that kind of show two different sides of what it was like to be a closeted queer teenager in the 80s. And I have a lot of affection for them. And, you know, some of my favorite characters, though, are side characters that are just fun to write. I have a haunted house novel called 324 Abercorn, where there's a character named Harold, who is also a drag queen named Titty Titty Gangbang. 
And he was, every scene I wrote with him was just pure pleasure. And I have a horror novel called Sequel that also has a, a side character um, who's a pop star named Leilani. And I don't know, they're, they're just so fun that I look forward to scenes they're going to be in. And sometimes they end up taking over parts of the novel more than I imagine, just because I have so much fun writing them. Well, that's interesting. So what makes a good good book to you or a good story? Like, what is it that holds your attention? Sort of like when I'm writing, what really draws me into a book is character. I mean, I love a great premise, um, a good pace, but I have to be attached to those characters, and I don't always have to like them. I know I feel like. People talk about likability, and it's a little overrated because I think sometimes when people complain that characters aren't likable enough, it's because we can't face the fact that we're not always likable. <laughs> like, sometimes we all have our moments. So I like characters that are just interesting and complex, and that'll, that'll bring me along. I can read a book that isn't plot-heavy as long as I'm into the characters because if I'm in love with the characters enough, I'll kind of follow them wherever they go. Um, I know I, I'm a fan of the author Joe Lansdale, and there was one book he wrote um, where the, the main characters, for a chunk of the book, all they were doing was fixing up an old house. wasn't really propelling the plot forward, but because I found those characters fascinating, I didn't care. I was just enjoying hanging out with them. Have, have you ever been part of um, writing a story and um, halfway through you get stuck or you kind of lose interest or you stop and you don't know what to do? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, I've had a few instances where I will get partway through a book and sometimes I can't even pinpoint what happened. Like I'll run out of steam and usually I, I'll spend a little bit of time going back into it because sometimes I can pick the momentum back up. But if I can't, I don't have any qualms with putting it aside and starting something new. Almost everything I've ever put aside, I've eventually gone back to and finished. Um, sometimes there may be a, a few years have passed, but what usually happens is I'll get to thinking about it. I'll pull up what I had written, start reading back through it, and get excited by the story again. And usually over that time, any plot problems I was having, it's working in the back of my mind. I, I suddenly can see ways to get past them, to overcome them. So, but yeah, um, I mean, I actually just started a new novel, but I, I was in the middle of another novel that I put aside because I was just kind of losing steam and... I put it aside, I'm going to work on this one, and then go back to that one when I'm done. Have you ever gone back to one of your older books and decided that you'd like to rewrite it or rework it somehow? Not really. I am kind of of the opinion that books are a time capsule. They're a time capsule of the time that they're written, but they're also a time capsule of what a writer was capable of at that point. Some of my earlier books, I probably feel like I could do better now, but what I ask myself when I look at them is, is that the best I could do then? And if the answer is yes, then I still feel proud of it because it's a journey. It's like as a reader, I know there are some writers who are embarrassed by their early work and want it to go out of print. But I like following that journey with a writer. I like seeing how they developed. Um, so... I would probably never go back and redo one of my earlier works. What do you think you get out of uh, each time you write a book or a story and you get one published? Is how, how do you think it changes you? Well, I mean, I hope just the act of doing it over and over improves my ability to tell a good story. Um, I feel like it does. I feel like with each book I learn something. Um, maybe on one book, I learn about pacing. Maybe in another book, I learned about character. Um, I wrote a couple that I learned. One of the trickiest things is to have a book with a twist ending that plays fair so that if you go back and reread it, you can see everything was leading to that twist, even if you didn't see it on the first reading. And that's kind of tricky. So I wrote a couple of books where I felt like I was learning that. Um, but more than anything, every book I write, I want to have fun. Even if it's a dark, depressing book, 
It sounds weird, but I can write a dark, depressing scene and still have a lot of fun because I'm just here making up stories, which is what I love. So I feel like the more I write, the more I get in touch with that and the more important that is to me that I, I don't need to focus on. Is this the book that an audience wants? Is this the book that's going to be easy to sell? It's, is this the book that I'm going to have the most fun with? Is there anybody that you'd like to work with out there? Well, I've collaborated with a couple of writers, and I have enjoyed the process. Um, that's always a learning experience, too, um, because I feel like you can learn from other authors. I will say I never approach them because I always feel weird about approaching writers and saying, do you want to work with me? Um, but um and a lot of the writers I really admire are probably out of my league, but also don't really collaborate. So, um, but like, I, I love the work of, um, Joe Lansdale. Um, I love the work of, um, Ron Rash, who isn't that well known, but I'm trying to think. I, I've worked with, um, actually in the book, um, Against the Clock, where my novella Septic appears, there's a writer named Shane Nelson who has a, a novella on there and we've actually written two other novellas together and that was a lot of fun. Um, I, I actually wouldn't mind working with him again and I worked with an, an author named Aaron Dries once on a novel called, uh, Where the Dead Go to Die and I wouldn't mind working with him again either. Uh, and we've talked about it but we, we just haven't been able to, uh, find the right project. Well, when it comes to collaboration like that, what's your process? Do you go back and forth or, uh, yeah, just come, how does that work for you? Um, it's actually worked different with different authors. Like when I wrote um, with Shane, um, it was back and forth. It's like um, he would write a chapter, send it to me. I would write a chapter. Um, and it was very similar. I wrote a novel with uh, James Newman, and we did it that way. But when I worked with um, Aaron, it was completely different. I would do the first pass of a chapter, and then he would kind of fill it in because I'm a more bare bones writer. He's a much more descriptive writer. So he would kind of fill it in. And then sometimes things he would do would kind of change my idea for what I was going to do in the next chapter. Um, so that one was a completely different experience. But, you know, I always say whatever works uh, with a writer, um, because when I when I look for writers to work with, it's not necessarily about do we have similar styles or do we have similar ways of working? It's do we have similar approaches? I'm always looking for writers who always approach writing like I do as something that's fun and not a chore. No, no. When you're writing a horror, do you, do you think about the violence on the page and how you're going to write any sort of you know graphic or killing or anything like that? Are you conscious of it, or do you think about it, or do you just just do what you do? I don't give it a lot of thought. I sort of get the story going and let it tell me how violent it needs to be because I've written some horror novels that are very violent. I've written some that aren't as violent. Um, what I sometimes call gentle horror, um, especially the ghost stories um, because those I'm focusing more on the atmosphere and more on um, a sense of the surreal. Um, but so I let the story dictate if a story is something that feels like there's going to be a lot of violence in it. I don't shy away from it if that's what the story kind of dictates that it needs. Well, speaking of horror, you know, uh, horror kind of imploded after the 80s, kind of like the early 90s. Do you feel that um, today horror is making a comeback? I feel like, especially in the small press world, horror is thriving. In the larger New York publishing world, you know, I feel like it's still a few names and nothing more, but it, it does seem cyclical. Um, things come back around, like even in the small press world, like, you know, zombies are hot now and then everyone hates them, but they'll come back around. Same with vampires and ghost stories. So I, I definitely feel like in the mainstream, in the big New York publishing, it's, it's, it's not alive the way it was. Uh, we don't have a lot of those great publishers we used to have. I was obsessed with the Dell Abyss line. Um, back in the nineties. Um, so we don't, we don't have as much of that. We don't even have things like leisure when it was around. Um, but you know, it's in the small press where I feel like 
there's a lot of great stuff being done. So a lot of the horror novels I read do come from the small press now. How do you present your suspense in a horror novel? Like, do you, do you like to build sort of mental terror up and stuff like that in, in your writing, or do you just go right for the kill? I like a buildup. I like, for suspense, I like it when there's that gradual rise of it. Uh, so where it's not everything at you all at once right up front. Um, but just that feeling of things being just slightly off kilter, a little surreal. And then it builds into some big moment, some big climax. Um, and you know, that's a very personal thing. Some people like a lot of action right up front. But for me, what I like to read is that kind of gradual build. So it tends to be what I like to write. What do you like to, do you like any of the horrors you see on, on, streaming now or anything like that do you like the way it's presented on uh on movies and television series i will say these days i probably watch more streaming shows as opposed to movies um because i i love i mean you know it's kind of cliche to say at this point but i do love stranger things i loved um the last of us um things like that i feel like especially with a a show you have more time to do that build because in a movie you have a very limited time. So things do have to ex escalate more quickly. Um, so for what I like, I do think the streaming shows uh, do it really well. I'm trying to remember the last horror movie that I really, really loved, but um, nothing is immediately coming to mind over the last couple of years. But, um, but yeah, I, I still like to seek out horror it doesn't all work for me, but but I feel like streaming is where I get more of what I like right now. Uh, it, there must be a lot of uh, pressure, too, for a lot of the uh, writers that are doing streaming to do a lot of things, you know, because they're, they're sure, certainly trying to make a lot of them. Where do you see yourself going? Like, what is it you want to accomplish? I mean, basically, it's going to sound like I'm not ambitious, but my ambitions are just to keep writing stories that I love, and I have fun with, keep trying to get them published. You know, every now and again, I will try to, I don't like to say up, move up the ladder, but, you know, I'll start sending out queries to agents. So far, I have had no bites, but, um, but I'm really happy in the small press world. There are a lot of different publishers that I, I enjoy working with. And to me, it's mostly about just enjoying myself. So I'm just going to keep on writing the stories that make me happy and, seeing who out there wants to publish. Like going to a lot of the uh, book cons or horror shows or anything like that, do you do any of those? Um, I've been to a few. I can't travel as much um, just, you know, for financial reasons. Um, so I don't get to go to as many as I, I like. Um, I have to go to the ones that are closer. I did get to go to the World Horror Convention one year, several years ago. That was a lot of fun. And there were a couple of local ones I got to go to. Those are always fun just because you're with your, you're with your people. You're with the people who understand that, you know, cause a lot of times when you're a horror fan and you're out in the world, like I've even done events at like the public library in my area. And when they find out you write horror, you sort of get that look <laughs> and they are not ashamed to tell you that they will not be buying your book. And I'm like, well, thank you for specifically telling me that. But, um, but that, when you get to go to those specific horror conventions, you're with the people who love that stuff and understand, you know, there can be depth to it. There can be quality to it. And um, so that's always fun. And I always like to get to meet other writers that that always makes me happy and excited because we all do it differently. And I love to hear how other people approach it and what their process is. So that's always exciting. Now, are, are you uh, on social media? Do you like readers to find you on social media? Do you do a uh, um, website? Um, wh where do people find you? I'm on Facebook, even though younger people always tell me Facebook is for old people now. But I'm on Facebook, uh, Mark Allen Gunnels, and I'm on Twitter, Mark A. Gunnels. And I'm on Instagram as Make Reading Cool Again, where I just post pictures of books I love. But... um I haven't like made the leap into like the TikTok type of thing. I'm like I I'm, I'm I just feel a little too old to I'll break a hip if I try to make that leap. 
But um, but I, I do enjoy interacting with people on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And I have a blog, markgunnels.livejournal.com. It gets updated semi-regularly. <laughs> but um, I, I talk about just general writing stuff, and I like to interview other writers on there. Um, and that's about the extent of it. Um, technology, I was just talking to a friend today about you know, I remember when I first got on the Internet, it was all about message boards. And I was just on all these different message boards. But, like, you know, technology keeps changing. And then it was social media. And I'm probably a little behind the curve. But I'm doing my best for, for a guy my age. Oh, that's all you can do, you know. You you older folk, <laughs> you got to be careful. That's you right. know, get yourself into trouble. You end up in jail doing something, you know. Um, so we'll have everything up on our website as well so people can find you easily. What are you working on now? So you've got another story in the works, you said? I just started a new novel that I'm calling The Next Chapter, um, which I'm thinking of as a coming-of-age novel for people in their 50s. Uh, somebody on my social media coined it coming of middle age. But um, but I'm, I'm kind of having fun, kind of experimenting with it. Um, I've, I've always been more of a pantser than an outliner. But with this one, I really like, I have an initial premise where the character just stands up in the middle of a work meeting and without saying a word, walks out, walks out of the room, out of the building, out of his job. And he doesn't really know what he's going to do next. And I don't really know what he's going to do next. So we're going to discover it together. Oh, there you go. Well, Mark, I appreciate you being on the show. And of course, now your latest story is called Septic. And it's in the uh, book called Against the Clock. Is it going to be available by itself as well? Uh, not at this time right now. It's in um, Against the Clock with novellas from Shane Nelson and Brandon Ford. And it's digital paperback. And they even have a, a hardcover edition. So I hope I hope people enjoy mine. And I hope they, because I've read Shane and Brandon's, and they're great as well. Well, uh, our guest, Mark Allen Gunnels, thank you for being here. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Mark. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs>